Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about the ways Parliament interacts with the executive in A-level politics. So that's not just all the knowledge you need to know, but also key points of analysis and some of the most likely questions you could get asked in the exam, so that you can be fully prepared for that exam. So I'm going to start by um, going into the key potential essay questions and debates you get asked about, as well as the parts of the specification this video covers. I'm then going to look at the ways in which Parliament interacts with the executive. So looking at backbenchers, looking at select committees, um, looking at um, the opposition, and finally looking at ministerial question time, including PMQs. Then I'm going to look at the relationship between the executive and Parliament, looking at some kind of overall analysis and overall questions. Um, including a kind of final question on the extent to which the balance of power between Parliament and the executive has changed before going back to those questions we looked at at the start to uh, kind of look at how you could potentially structure your answers to. Them. So yeah, the PDF you should be seeing up there, um, you can find if you go to the first link in the description to the Politics Explained website, where you can also find a lot of um, free and paid resources to help you in your politics A-level, including essay plans, um, everything you need to know guides, and a place to sign up for tutoring if that's something you'd be interested in. Um, so yeah, let me know if you've got any questions or comments in the comment section below, and without further ado, let's get into it. So starting off with the parts of the specification this lesson covers. So this covers 2.4 of Parliament. So this is, in my opinion, the most important part of the Parliament topic and the most likely part of it you're going to get asked a question on in the exam. Um, so that covers the role and significance of backbenchers, the work of select committees, the role and significance of the opposition, and the purpose and nature of ministerial question time, including Prime Minister's questions. This um, video also um, covers the relationship between the executive and Parliament in the relations between the branches topic. Um, so that's looking at the influence and effectiveness of Parliament in holding the executive to account, the influence and effectiveness of the executive in attempting to exercise dominance over Parliament, and the extent to which the balance of power between Parliament and the executive has changed. So starting off by looking at some potential essay questions and key debates. So in terms of the um, key debates in relation to this topic, um, they are the effectiveness of Parliament in holding the government to account, including the effectiveness of individual parts of this scrutiny, such as select committees, backbenchers, PMQs. Um, and the balance of power between the executive and parliament. And if you make detailed essay plans on the questions involved below, you should be really well prepared for the exam. Um, these, um, or at least some of them, um, will soon also be available to purchase on the Politics Explained website. So in terms of these questions, you could get questions such as evaluate the view that the UK has an elective dictatorship, evaluate the view that the House of Commons is effective in scrutinising the executive or holding the government to account, um, evaluate the view that select committees are effective in scrutinising the executive, um, evaluate the view that backbenchers are effective in holding the government to account, or evaluate the view that Prime Minister's questions should be scrapped. Um, and finally, looking at kind of change over time, evaluate the view that changes in recent decades have limited the executive's dominance over Parliament. So a lot of different questions you can get asked, um, but we'll kind of go through these in the content of the video. So starting off with the ways in which Parliament interacts with the executive. And in this, starting off with backbenchers. So firstly, what are backbenchers? So backbenchers are all MPs who aren't in the government or the shadow cabinet. So they're the vast majority of MPs um, and they're often less experienced than those in the government or the shadow cabinet and so are sometimes considered unimportant lobby fodder um, whose key role is to vote how the party leadership wants them to. These um, backbench MPs and all MPs have parliamentary privilege. So all MPs and members of the House of Lords have parliamentary privilege which gives them legal immunity from any libel or slander laws from anything they say in Parliament, therefore giving them complete freedom of speech within Parliament. This allows them to carry out their duties without fear of legal repercussions. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Conservative backbench MP Bob Seeley, for example, used parliamentary privilege to name a number of the British lawyers who were supporting Russian oligarchs to fight legal battles against Western sanctions. If he hadn't done this in Parliament, he may have been sued for defamation. A key thing to know about backbenchers are the right reforms and the backbench business committee. So the right reforms were a set of reforms to the House of Commons that were pushed forward by Prime Minister Gordon Brown that sought to limit the executive and make it more accountable to Parliament. These reforms came into force after the 2010 general election. One of the key reforms was to set up the backbench business committee in 2010, which gave backbenchers much more of a say on the agenda of Parliament. The BBBC um, chose the topic of date, um, or chooses, sorry, the topic of debate for 35 days in each parliamentary session, which equates to around one day a week. Um, 
The committee often chooses debate topics um, that have cross-party support. For example, in February 2023, um, they held a debate in the House of Commons on the future of the NHS, including its funding and staffing. Members of the Backbench Business Committee are elected by their party group within Parliament, which limits the chances of rebellious um, MPs being selected. Um, in March 2023, a debate was held in response to an e-petition um, to make suicide prevention a compulsory part of the school curriculum, for example. So the other um, right reforms were, what well, the first one related to these kind of e-petitions, and that's that an e -peti a petitions committee was set up that selected issues for debate that were selected by the public via e-petitions, which had over 100,000 signatures. And the second one was in relation to select committees. Um, and that was that the chairs of select committees um, were elected by backbenchers rather than chosen by party leaders and whips, which, as we'll kind of go into in the select committees part, kind of made them um, more independent of the government. What I'm going to look at now is different ways in which backbenchers can exert influence and then um, counter them with limits to the influence of backbenchers. And you can really use these points um, in the essay on backbenchers. So starting off with ways in which backbenchers can exert influence. And the first one of these is rebellions. So a key way in which backbenchers of the governing party can exert influence is through rebelling against government bills in order to defeat the government and prevent a law being passed. The frequency of government defeats has increased a great deal since 2010 in large part due to the governments having smaller majorities or being coalitions. So Tony Blair was defeated just four times in his 10 years of office, all of which are in his third term, and Gordon Brown just three um, times in his three years of office. But Theresa May was defeated 33 times when she had a minority government, including the worst defeat in modern political history um, on the 15th of January 2019, when her government tried to get Parliament to approve its Brexit withdrawal agreement. Boris Johnson was defeated 12 times in just six months, when he had a minority government, and four times in three years when he had a majority government. And on the 15th of September 2021, an opposition day motion from the Labour Party calling on the government to cancel a planned £20 a week cut to universal credit was passed 253 to zero after the government told his MPs to abstain. So that shows how kind of opposition parties were able to kind of defeat the government and pass their own legislation, um, which is very rare. Further, some of the most serious rebellions aren't recorded as the government drops its proposals rather than suffering a defeat. Um, so, for example, in 2013, the coalition dropped its House of Lords reform plans when it was clear um, that there would have been a rebellion by Conservative backbenchers and it wouldn't have been passed. Next key way that um, backbenchers exert influence is through urgent questions. So urgent questions allow backbenchers um, slash the opposition to question ministers on matters of urgency and public importance. The speaker decides whether to grant urgent questions, and if they do, a government minister is required to attend the House of Commons to answer it immediately. They can be significant in allowing backbenchers and the opposition to question and scrutinise the government over important issues. And the use of urgent questions is very dependent on the Speaker of the House, but they've been used a lot more frequently um, under John Murko and Lindsay Hoyle, who are the two most recent speakers. So Lindsay Hoyle, um, for example, has averaged around zero average around 0 0.6 urgent questions um, per day, um, which compares to uh, Michael Martin, who was the speaker before John Burko, who granted just 0 0.07 on average over his tenure. An example of an urgent question was on the 30th of March 2023 um, in relation to junior doctor strikes that asked the government what they were doing to resolve the situation. A key example of an urgent question having influence was in April 2018 when Amber Rudd had to answer an urgent question posed by Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott uh, about deportation targets in the Home Office and her handling of the Windrush scandal. Pressure from Parliament and the media meant that Rudd decided, decided to resign soon after, having given Parliament inaccurate answers in that ministerial question and therefore having broken the ministerial code. Another key way in which backbenchers can have influence is through debates. So debates um, can allow backbenchers to scrutinise the government put issues on the political agenda and put pressure on the government to address them. There's a few types of different debates. So one is half hour adjournment debates at the end of each day, which give MPs the chance to raise a particular issue. Second is that MPs can request an emergency debate on matters requiring urgent consideration. And as with urgent questions for these, um, they need to win the approval of the speaker and other MPs. And as with urgent questions, these have become a lot more frequent under Burko and Hoyle. Um, and they're important in giving backbenchers more control over the parliamentary timetable and making sure important business is discussed in the House of Commons. So, for example, in May 2020, um, Rishi Sunak, as Chancellor, planned to announce the COVID-19 furlough scheme in the media, but was forced to do so in the House of Commons after Hoyle granted an urgent question to Shadow Chancellor Annalise Dodds. 
For around one day per week, debates in the House of Commons and Westminster Hall are decided by the Backbench Business Committee. And finally, if an e-petition receives over 100,000 signatures, it's usually debated after being considered by the Petitions Committee. Um, so, for example, there have been debates on Trump's proposed visit to the United Kingdom when he was president. Um, and in March 2023, a debate was held in response to an e-petition to make suicide prevention um, a compulsory part of the school curriculum. A final way um, in which backbenchers can have influence is through is their legislative influence. So backbenchers take part in public bill committees, which have between 16 and 50 MPs and scrutinised legislation um, passing through the House of Commons, um, and they can propose amendments in these committees. Backbenchers can also propose private members' bills through entering a ballot, 10-minute rule bills or presentation. For a bit more detail on that, look at the legislative process video um, on the Politics Explained YouTube channel. Um, so MPs who, who kind of want to propose the private members will often enter a ballot at the start of parliamentary session and 20 MPs are chosen um, and they're able to propose a bill on one of the 13 Fridays in the parliamentary session. And there have been notable pieces of legislation that began as private members building, including the Abortion Act of 1967 and the Assault on Emergency Workers Act of 2018, which was introduced by Labour MP Chris Bryan. So they're the ways in which um, backbenchers can um, exert significant influence in Parliament. On the other hand, now I'm going to go through some limits to the influence of backbenchers. So the first one of these is the government's power of patronage. So crucially, MPs are influenced by their party ties and the power of patronage. Backbenchers from the governing party want to retain their seat and hope one day to serve in government. And as a result, they just want to demonstrate their loyalty to the government and to the whips in particular by voting with the government and supporting the government in urgent questions and debates. And if backbenchers prove to be disloyal, they have very little chance of um, getting into the cabinet or even into government at all um, and may even be kicked out of their party. Further, rebellions have a lot less influence when the government has a significant majority. Uh, so when the government has a significant majority in the House of Commons, rebellions are much less, much less likely to be successful um, and are therefore a great deal less common. Tony Blair, for example, was defeated just four times in his 10 years in office. And backbenchers, this is because backbenchers are less likely to risk their political careers by rebelling against the government when they have little chance of winning. Now, um, a, another kind of counterpoint um, to the influence of backbenchers is that there's actually kind of backbenchers have very limited actual influence in debates and urgent questions. So though they may be able to raise the profile of an issue and get it on the agenda, they are much less, less likely to get any action taken as a result of debates or urgent questions or to influence government policy. So the 10 minute rule bill, for example, allows MPs to speak for just 10 minutes um, on a subject they're concerned about, but really just gives them a chance to air their views. Further, MPs today spend a lot less time in the House of Commons um, debating legislation than they used to. Instead, they spend a lot more time in their constituencies um, and therefore can be seen as having, having less influence within the House of Commons. So MPs between 2006 and 2021 spent just 24% of their time in the chamber. And then finally, um, got some counterpoints to the legislative influence um, of backbenchers. So backbenchers can propose amendments to government legislation through public bill committees, but governments have a majority in these committees and will usually defeat amendments it doesn't support. Secondly, private members' bills have very little chance of success if they aren't supported by the government. And finally, the it's the government that controls most of the parliamentary timetable, and has in recent years increasingly rushed legislation through the House of Commons, therefore limiting effective legislative scrutiny from backbenchers. So yeah, that's everything in terms of backbenchers. What I'm going to look at now is select committees. So select committees in their current form were introduced by the Thatcher government in 1979, and there is a select committee for every government department with the aim of scrutinising policy, administration and spending, whilst there are also a number of non-departmental select committees with specific functions. So examples of these are the Public Accounts Committee, which examines government expenditure to ex ensure money isn't being unnecessarily wasted, and the Liaison Committee, which consists of the chairs of every other select committee and questions the Prime Minister twice a year across the whole field of government policy. In terms of the selection and composition of select committees, each departmental select committee consists of a minimum of 11 backbenchers, with their composition reflecting the balance of parties in the House of Commons. Select committees are almost always chaired by a member of the governing party. So for, just to give an example, following the 2019 election, the Education Committee consists of seven Tory MPs, four Labour MPs, and is chaired by Conservative MP Robin Walker. Prior to the right reforms, the chairs of select committees used to be selected by party whips, which limited the effectiveness of their government scrutiny as they were less independent um, from the government and the whips are likely to choose um, members who would kind of 
provide little effective scrutiny and kind of support the government. Um, following the right reforms of 2010, however, chairs are now elected by their fellow MPs, which has increased their independence. Members are chosen by secret ballot within party groups and often chosen for their prominence and experience in the relevant policy area. So, for example, um, Tobias Elwood, who is the current chair of the Defence Select Committee, was a captain in the British Army. And this has also allowed prominent um, backbench MPs who oppose the government on some issues to obtain key roles in select committees when they're unlikely to be given roles in government because they criticise the government. Um, so Conservative backbencher and former Immigration Minister Caroline Noakes, for example, is the chair of the Women and Equalities Select Committee um, and has consistently criticised the government, including in relation to its plans um, to house asylum seekers in barracks, yet it's able to have significant, um, kind of op adopt a, a place of significant power within the House of Commons as the chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee, despite this, as they're now, um, those chairs are now not selected by the whips. So finally, what select committees do, um, what do select committees do, and what authority do they have? The members of select committees decide themselves on the areas they will investigate within the department or policy area they're scrutinising. They examine the policies, performance and expenditure of departments, give their views on proposals for legislation and interview candidates for some public roles. For example, the Treasury Select Committee um, can veto the Chancellor's choice for the head of the Office for Budget Responsibility. They have the power to gather evidence, both oral and written, and to summon witnesses, including ministers, civil servants um, and members of the public with a relevant interest. They can also appoint special advisors, often academics, in the field they're investigating to assist them in their work. And they ultimately produce reports, which the government is then expected to respond to within two months. What I'm going to look at now, just to sum up the uh, select committee's topic, is the ways in which select committees are important and influential, and the ways in which um, their influence is limited. So starting off with the ways in which they're important and influential. So select committees look in-depth into issues. Their questioning is calm, measured and professional, and political answers aren't accepted. Scrutiny is therefore a lot more professional and less partisan than PMQs. The work of select committees is respected because it's evidence-based and the fact they hold televised hearings increases their influence. As they air issues of public interest, they are often reported on in the media. So, for example, in March 2023, the Privileges, the Privileges Select Committee scrutinised former Prime Minister Boris Johnson over his involvement in the Partygate scandal, which garnered a lot of public interest and media attention. The government then has to publicly respond to their findings or reports in eight weeks, and they can sometimes have a direct influence on government policy. So, for example, in 2014, the Home Office took the passport office back under ministerial control um, following a critical report by the Home Affairs Select Committee. And the Office of Budget Responsibility was first suggested by the Treasury Select Committee. Long-serving um, members can also become knowledgeable about a particular policy area, the ministers, um, who may only stay in their department for a couple of years. And it's now recognised as kind of an alternative um, career path to the ministerial ladder, so Margaret Hodge, who is chair of the Public Accounts Select Committee from 2010 to 2015, for example, said she has more influence in that role than as a minister early in her career. And then a final point is that the Liaison Committee, which kind of went through a bit earlier, um, directly questions and scrutinises the Prime Minister twice a year, which can be seen as really effective scrutiny. So, on the other hand, ways in which the influence of select committees is limited is firstly that a majority of select committee members are drawn from the governing party, and there's a tradition that influential Treasury, Foreign Affairs and Defence Committees are chaired by MPs of the governing party. This limits their independence from the government and the likelihood they will provide effective scrutiny. On the other hand, you could counter that with the right reforms um, and say that actually they've been made more independent since those right reforms, even if the, government still, the governing party still has a majority. Though available resources have increased, select committees can, can also only cover a limited range of topics in depth um, and therefore can't provide like, really effective scrutiny on everything a department's doing. Select committees' power to summon witnesses is also considerable but not unlimited. Um, so in 2013, Home Secretary Theresa May blocked the Home Affairs Select Committee from interviewing Andrew Parker, who's the head of the MI5. And a key point is that the government only accepts about 40% of select committee recommendations. Um, and even these are only minor changes. So that limits the kind of, yes, they can produce reports, but are they actually accepted? Do they actually have that much influence? Um, and then two final points is that Boris Johnson twice cancelled appointments to, the, to attend the Liaison Select Committee. Um, and that shows how kind of Prime Minister has been able to avoid scrutiny. And finally, unlike in the US, Select Committees don't have a direct role in proposing legislation. The final thing on select committees is looking at how Lord select committees are different. So if you get a question on select committees, you're very much mainly going to focus on the House of Commons. Um, but select committees in the Lords don't shadow government departments. 
Instead, they scrutinise legislation and investigate particular issues. So, for example, the Constitution Committee examines the constitutional importance of implications, sorry, of public bills and invest, investigates broad constitutional issues. Um, and Lords Committees de deliberately avoid kind of duplicating the work of their Commons counterparts. What makes Lord Committees effective is that they can draw on the service, services of a range of well-qualified experts in different fields to make up their membership. Um, on the other hand, though, whilst their reports may be learned and thorough, thoroughly researched, their wider impact is usually limited, especially in comparison um, to the impact of the common select committees. OK, so now moving on to the opposition. So firstly, what is the opposition? The formal opposition is the second largest party in the House of Commons, which forms a shadow cabinet to shadow and scrutinise government departments while providing alternative policies to the government as a government in waiting. So as you can see in the picture, the current form of the opposition is um, the Labour Party um, and headed by Keir Starmer and his shadow cabinet. So firstly, the ways in which the opposition provides effective scrutiny. So the fact that the opposition shadows government departments and provides alternative policies to the um, to the government puts pressure on the government to perform effectively and forces them to defend their policies against possible alternatives. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper, for example, has criticised the approach of Sunak's government um, in relation to immigration, um, instead proposing a focus on making the asylum system work and processing the backlog of asylum cases. The leader of the opposition, currently Keir Starmer, is able to directly question the Prime Minister at PMQs and follow up on their questions. And they're also able to respond to major government, government statements, such as the budget. The same is true of um, all shadow ministers for their respective ministers in ministerial question time. The opposition can also attack the government in the media and pile pressure on the government, as Starmer did effectively um, when the party gate scandal broke. There are 20 opposition days in the parliamentary can calendar um, where they can set the parliamentary agenda, scrutinise the government and seek to introduce legislation. So on the 15th of September 2021, an opposition day motion from the Labour Party calling on the government to cancel a planned £20 a week cut to universal credit was passed 253 to zero after, government, after the government told its MPs to abstain. So as a consequence, the planned cut was stopped. Um, so that shows that they can kind of have some influence um, through their opposition days. So the opposition can also work with government rebels to defeat government bills, and they receive £6.8 million in short money each year as well as um, help from the civil service in the run-up to an election, which helps them develop policies, scrutinise the government and provide a real alternative to voters. On the other hand, some ways in which the opposition provides ineffective scrutiny is that as they're focused on kind of developing their own policies um, and becoming a government in waiting, the opposition can be seen as not being solely focused on scrutinising the executive, um, but also appearing good to the public themselves. So that can be seen as kind of distracting them from actual scrutiny. Um, as they've also got political motives. Secondly, when the government has a large majority, there's very little the opposition can do to stop government bill being passed. Further, the government controls the majority of the parliamentary timetable, with 20 opposition days being a very small number. Thirdly, the majority of motions or bills proposed through opposition days face government amendments which cancel out these motions, and though the opposition does receive £6.8 million in short money, this is very little in comparison to the huge departments with thousands of civil servants that the government controls. And finally, the opposition often struggles to gain media attention when the government is popular or performing highly important functions. So during COVID, for example, Starmer was um, able to gain very little traction, and he was able to gain very little traction for kind of the first year and a half um, he was Labour Party leader. So that's everything in terms of the opposition. What we're going to look at now is ministerial question time, including Prime Minister's questions. So what is ministerial question time? Every week, government ministers are questioned in Parliament about the work of their departments by both backbenchers and the opposition. The majority of these questions are pre-written, with ministers able to prepare detailed answers, while others are in-person oral questions in response to which ministers have to think on their feet. This provides effective detailed scrutiny on a weekly basis and is a lot more calm than PMQs. So when, what is Prime Minister's question? So the most well-known and focused, version, focused on version of, of ministerial questions is Prime Minister's questions, um, which takes place in the House of Commons every Wednesday at 12pm and lasts 30 minutes. The opposition leader is able to directly question and scrutinise the Prime Minister on key political events that week, whilst backbenchers are also able to ask questions. So firstly, looking at the ways in which uh, ministerial question time, including PMQs and kind of particularly PMQs, provides effective scrutiny. 
is that the leader of the opposition um, gets six questions and the leader of the third largest party gets two questions to directly um, question the government um, and get the government to respond to their questions in PMQs, therefore giving them the ability to expose government failures and suggest why they'd be more effective. The government is forced to address the, um, the concerns of the public, the opposition and backbenchers. So Corbyn, for example, made a habit of asking questions from members of the public. Some opposition leaders are highly effective in scrutinising the work of government. Starmer, for example, is reasonably good um, given his experience as a prosecutor. Misleading the House of Commons can lead to huge pressure to resign, which forces ministers and the Prime Minister in particular to be competent and on top of their policy brief and the work of their department. And this can be seen as decreasing the likelihood um, that incompetent party leaders who favour political demagoguery over rational argument will lead a major party into an election, as they would embarrass and harm the party's image every Wednesday at PMQs. Last um, kind of two arguments that can be seen as effective is that PMQs is televised every week and the most watched aspect of politics among the public, which can be seen as highly important to encouraging public engagement in politics and exposing government failures to the public. And finally, even if PMQs may sometimes not be effective scrutiny as it's highly partisan, um, it can be seen as important in providing genuine political debate between parties and MPs nonetheless. So even if it's not good scrutiny, it plays a key role by showing the public um, the key debate between the main parties. And it therefore presents voters with a clear choice, which is important in a democracy, especially in the run up to elections. On the other hand, ways in which ministerial question time, including PMQs, doesn't provide effective scrutiny is that it can be argued that PMQs in particular provides little effective scrutiny as it's more focused on partisan political point scoring than actual scrutiny. Many government backbenchers are questions draft, drafted by the whips, which are intended to flatter rather than actually scrutinise the government. Um, they often say something along the lines of, does the government agree that the government is doing a great job in this area? That's not really effective scrutiny at all. It's just flattery. Ministers and prime ministers often give political answers intended to deflect and get sound bites for social media clips rather than to honestly answer scrutiny. Therefore, it can be argued it's actually not very effective scrutiny. Secondly, PMQs is very boisterous and more parliamentary theatre than effective scrutiny, and as a result, it can be argued this presents a very negative view of politicians to the public, um, therefore decreasing trust in politicians and the political process. Finally, the effect of scrutiny is also very dependent on the abilities of backbenchers and the leader of the opposition. Um, so Corbyn in particular was often seen as a poor performer in PMQs and not providing effective scrutiny. And finally, um, it can be argued that PMQs should be scrapped um, and replaced with great use of other scrutiny, such as the Liaison Committee, which provides far more in-depth and meaningful questioning of the Prime Minister. So yeah, that's everything in terms of, in terms of, kind of different types of scrutiny um, within the House of Commons. What I'm going to look at now is an overall look at the relationship between the executive and parliament, and this also covers the kind of um, 4.2 of the relationship between branches topic. So first of all, it's kind of quite summary as well, but of what we've done so far, but ways in which parliament is effective in holding the government to account. Um, first of all, backbenchers are able to hold the government to account using urgent questions and emergency debates, which allow scrutiny of the government on important issues. Secondly, backbenchers can unite with the opposition to rebel and defeat proposed government legislation. Parliament can also um, scrutinise government legislation in public bill committees and propose their own legislation in private members' bills. Select committees can be seen as providing effective and detailed scrutiny. The opposition can be seen as um, providing similarly effective scrutiny, as can um, PMQs and ministerial question time. Um, whilst backbench business committee and opposition days allow Parliament to control the parliamentary timetable for parts of the week. Um, finally, also the House of Lords can be seen as now more effective and professional since the um, new Labour's reforms. Um, and then some, some other key powers that the House of Lords can bring down um, the government using a vote of no confidence. Um, and also it's recent, a recent development um, is the convention that the government must gain parliamentary consent for major military action. Um, and that can be seen as having limited the executive's prerogative power in this area. So there are ways um, in which the influence and effectiveness of parliament um, so the ways in which Parliament can be seen as effective in holding the executive to account. On the other hand, I've got some ways in which the executive can exercise dominance over Parliament. So the first past the post voting system usually produces governments with large majorities, um, therefore limiting the frequency and effectiveness of rebellions. The Prime Minister's power of patronage allows them to control both the government and their party um, and ensure MPs are pretty loyal to the government, um, which leads to kind of very little successful rebellions as well. 
Further, over 100 MPs are part of the government and therefore bound by collective um, ministerial responsibility to vote with the government, which is known as the payroll vote. Also, the government controls most of Parliament's agenda um, and can use its majority to schedule business in the House of Commons. Private members' bills are also very unlikely to be passed if they're not backed by the government. Threats to resign the government and therefore force a general election can force rebelling MPs into line, though this is used sparingly. And the government controls secondary legislation and introduces thousands of statutory instruments each year to change laws. The House of Lords also can't veto legislation um, and the effectiveness of kind of debates, select committees and PMQs in providing effective scrutiny um, can be seen as limited. So yeah, obviously a lot of points there. All of these were covered in kind of different videos, either this video or different videos on the Politics Explained YouTube channel on the Parliament topics. So make sure to look at those. Um, but that just gives kind of an overview of kind of all also a lot of the key arguments um, on either side in relation to whether Parliament's effective at scrutinising the executive or is the executive kind of effective at avoiding parliamentary scrutiny and kind of doing what it wants. Finally, um, what's really important, you should really use this in all of your essays when you're looking at Parliament, um, is that the kind of balance of power between Parliament and the executive is very dependent on the government's majority um, and the popularity of the government. So when the government has a large majority, they're able to exercise dominance over Parliament, as government legislation is very rarely defeated. When the government has a small or no majority, by contrast, Parliament can inflict significant defeats on the government. Further, when the government is popular, parliamentary scrutiny is unlikely to have much impact at all, um, as it's unlikely um, to harm the government's prospects of winning at the next general election. But when the government is less popular, parliamentary scrutiny can gain significant media attention and inflict significant harm on the government and on its prospects of winning the next general election. So the final um, thing I'm going to quickly look at is the extent to which the balance of power between parliament and the executive has changed. So arguments of power that parliament has grown in power and assertiveness in recent years are firstly the right reforms, which you looked at like the start of the video. Secondly, new Labour's reforms to the House of Lords, um, where it's become more professional and independent of the government, um, and therefore more assertive in scrutinising and resisting government legislation. And thirdly, in comparison to before 2010, many of the governments and governing parties have been weak, divided and unpopular on key issues, therefore emboldening and increasing the power of Parliament, as well as decreasing the power of the executive. The final thing is the debate over the U whether the UK has an elected dictatorship. So firstly, what is an elected dictatorship? So in the 1970s, Conservative peer Lord Hailsham argued that Britain had an elected dictatorship, as the government was able to force its business through Parliament with little difficulty, especially since the reduced powers of the Lords following the 1949 Parliament Act and the Salisbury Convention. This was the case even when the government had the support um, of a minority of the population. So often the government will have a significant majority in Parliament with just minority support, like just a minority support from like actual minority support from the population. So I think um, the 2019 Conservative, after the 2019 election, the Conservative government had 56% of the seats, which is 43% of the votes. So that's a good synoptic link back to first past the post as well. So finally, going to look at some arguments that um, the UK does have an elected dictatorship. So the kind of counterpoints to this are kind of in the arguments that Parliament is effective at holding the government to account. So arguments that it does have an elected dictatorship is that the government controls the vast majority of the legislative agenda and can pass secondary legislation with little parliamentary opposition or scrutiny. Secondly, the Supreme Court has no power to strike down legislation passed by Parliament, even if it infringes upon human rights. First past the post also produces strong governments which have far from majority support among the population, but nonetheless have a majority in Parliament, um, and they're able to introduce major policy and constitutional changes despite their limited support. Um, these school governments are also very rarely defeated in Parliament, whilst um, they have majorities in both public bill committees and select committees. The power of patronage and whipping give the executive and the prime minister significant control over the parliamentary party. Um, and the House of Lords have limited power to prevent government legislation being passed due to the Parliament's Act and the Salisbury Convention. So yeah, that was everything in terms of content. That was obviously a lot. Um, definitely go through it in different sections and look over it at different times and use kind of essay plans. Some of them, you could use the ones on the website or make some of your own to kind of help um, prepare. What I'm going to quickly look at now um, is some of these essay questions and how you could potentially answer them. So firstly, um, evaluate the view that the House of Commons is effective in scrutinising the executive. For that one, you could kind of pick three um different types of scrutiny. So you could look at back benches, select committees, and kind of ministerial question time, and have kind of for and against for those, and then come to an overall conclusion about how effective um, 
um, Parliament is at scrutinising the executive. Um, for select committees, go into those arguments in the select committees topic, look at the kind of for and against and kind of sort them into kind of match them up to sort them into three paragraphs. Um, for the backbenchers question, evaluate the view that backbenchers are effective in holding the government to account. Um, I'd probably do kind of first paragraph on how rebellions can be effective um, against the fact that rebellions are kind of often ineffective and don't happen very much when the government has a large majority and the government's power of patronage is effective. Second paragraph, you could do urgent questions and debates against the arguments that urgent questions and debates aren't that actually that effective in influencing um, legislation. Um, and then for the third one, let me scroll up and quickly check um, what the third one would be. So the third one, you probably do then legislative influence. So the argument that backbenchers have significant legislative influence versus kind of the counterpoints that they don't. And then kind of finally looking at evaluate the view that changes in recent decades have limited the executive's dominance over parliament. Um, for that one, I potentially look at the right reforms, look at um, the reforms to the House of Lords introduced um, by New Labour, and you need to look at kind of the constitution video and other parts of the parliament topic for that one. And the final one, final paragraph, you could look at um, how a lot of the government since 2010 um, and a lot of the governments lately have been a lot weaker, and that's kind of emboldened and enabled parliament to be a lot more um, kind of effective and limited the executive's dominance over parliament. So yeah, hopefully that should give you some idea on how you could answer some of those questions. Um, let me know in the comment section below if there's anything I can help with. Um, and as I said, the PDF you should be seeing up there, you can find on the Politics Explained website, where there's also a lot of essay plans, including on these topics, um, that can really help you um, prepare for your exams, as well as a place to sign up for tutoring if that's something you'd be interested in. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.